Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute. And we're now on the Hill at the American Foreign Policy Council. If you haven't visited, pay a visit sometime. It's a different model of think tank than what you see down on Massachusetts Avenue, and we're very happy to be there. Our topic today, we discussed last time, is yet another section from a book which we decided to undertake six, seven months ago in light of all the really dramatic legislative and other acts taking place in Uzbekistan. We don't pretend to know where this will all come out. History, the future is always unknown. However, we wanted to have a baseline understanding of this really quite dramatic era of change so that over the coming years, people not just here but around the world can turn to one central place, namely a book, and be able to evaluate the actual process of implementation of these reforms in areas as diverse as international relations, we heard Richard Weiss on that subject, and we want as diverse as the legal uh, and, and le uh, uh, legal system, human rights, the government, governmental system, including elective bodies and the parliamentary system, and local, local governance. Uh, all these areas we wanted to cover. Religion is the subject of a major chapter which we will be presenting in another session like this. Our topic today is the economy. And this is an area, obviously, this was the first to be noticed by the international press. By the way, we have an interesting chapter in this book is on the astonishing neglect by the international press, east and west, of what's going on. You would have thought that, that some of them would have assigned someone to go to Tashkent and go around and talk to people and collect the kind of information we collected. They're east, west, north, or south, they haven't done it. It's amazingly thin coverage. And, and so we have a chapter on that, too, which I hope might wake some of the press up to this, these important developments. Uh, our, our focus today is on the economy. And we, we are really uh, honored to have not just our colleague and good friend, Mamukut Saratelli, the cha chapter's author, uh, um, with, by the way, some, some uh, 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 assistance and, and uh, material provided by Richard Pomfret, an old friend of our institutes. Uh, uh, Dr. Ceratelli, you know, he's done a lot of work on energy, on the whole Caspian Black Sea nexus, and so on. And, and then today, our, our real, we're really honored to have the mission chief for Uzbekistan and Yemen, curiously. <laughs> yeah, you can explain that curious combination to us. <laughs> Mr. Albert Yeager, who's been with the IMF for 25 years, and uh, uh, he's also uh, been an assistant professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Vienna. At IMF, he worked for uh, the Fiscal Ed Ed Affairs Department, European Department, Middle East and Central Asian Department. And we will also hear from Mr. David Gould, as a lead economist in the Europe and Central Asia area and region at the, at the World Bank. Currently, he's leading a regional study on networks and connectivity in Europe and Central Asia, and a development policy operation in Uzbekistan. During his 13 years at the bank, he has led teams to deliver country development strategies. That's what this is all about, country development strategies. Um, uh, and analytic and lend, uh, on, and analytical and lending operations in Latin America, Europe, and South Asia. I couldn't imagine two people I more want to have comment on this chapter than these two gentlemen. It's an honor for us to have them here today. We're very glad that all you are here, including the newly arrived Rumsfeld fellows from across the region from part of our, our joint program with the Rumsfeld Foundation. Welcome to you all. And uh, we will have an initial presentation by 
Dr. Zeratelli, and then we will hear from our from our two commentators, and then you will have ample time to chime in on your own. There are a couple of seats in front, if you will. <clears throat> Thank you, Fred. Um, I impose on myself this challenge by inviting these two wonderful gentlemen, uh, who will be, I'm sure, uh, uh, harsh and uh, but objective critics of uh, what we've done so far. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion going forward. I'd like to start with a couple of uh, uh, points uh, that uh, what I thought about when I started working on this on this project, on this uh, uh, paper, on this study. First of all, I wanted to describe uh, processes that are happening in Uzbekistan, obviously objectively, uh, uh, and processes are very interesting, obviously, that are happening there. So we wanted to make sure that progress is, is described objectively and properly. Second thing, I wanted to encourage optimists, because what is happening now is very significant and needs to be supported. And also, I wanted to keep expectations under control, because this is just the beginning of the long process of reforms. And ultimate success will depend on strong political will to carry out sometimes painful reforms and to overcome potentially bumpy road. So these are the kind of underlying assumptions that I wanted to kind of address, uh, or basic sort of uh, uh, background I wanted to uh, start my, uh, my, my work on this, on this project. I also want to recognize Dr. Richard Pomfret's uh, uh, contribution to this, uh, to this project. So when um, President, President Mizio succeeded uh, Islam Karimov as president of Uzbekistan, many observers expected his tenure to represent continuity rather than change. And while continuity is present in terms of focus on independence and sovereignty of Uzbekistan, Mizio also showed pr proactive desire to improve foreign relations and initiate major economic reforms designed to strengthen the uh, strategic position of Uzbekistan. President Mizio inherited an economic structure left behind by his predecessor who consistently emphasized that his approach to economic change had been based on gradualism. After independence, small-scale privatization based on it, an appeal to a tradition of family homes and small businesses was quickly implemented. In the 90s, the Uzbek economy benefited from abundance of cotton, which was relatively easy to bring to world markets at very high price at the time. The state's marketing monopoly ensured that a substantial share of the high cotton revenues went to state budget and uh, for government, to fund government expenses. By some measures, Uzbekistan was the best performing of all Soviet uh, successful states in the 90s, desire, um, and despite the rejection of rapid reforms uh, recommended by international financial institutions, by the end of the decade, it was the first Soviet uh, successor state to uh, actually regain its pre-1991 uh, real GDP level. However, falling cotton prices in late 90s led the government to abandon its commitment to make currency convertible and instead to introduce strict exchange controls. When global demand dipped in decade, decade later, the government again tightened uh, foreign exchange controls, leading to the emergence of sub uh, substantial black market. Very much as a result of this multiple exchange rate economy, Uzbekistan also failed to further diversify its economy. Also, Uzbekistan's borders remain tightly controlled, both for security reasons, but also to protect import competing uh, industries. Inefficiency of governance became one of the major societal challenges for growth and development in Uzbekistan, contributing to many illnesses of the economy, including unemployment. As a result, several million migrants went, uh, were forced to, to uh, move abroad, primarily to Russia, in search of work. And by 2010, Uzbekistan's social policies, once a source of pride, were perceived to be deteriorated. Need for economic reforms was understood in Uzbek leadership even before the transition of power in 19, uh, 2016. Uh, Uzbekistan has started the uh, reform policies already by 2012, and uh, I'm sure our colleague from the World Bank would mention that in 2012, uh, Uzbekistan actually was top reformer, uh, improved, started already by then starting to uh, improve uh, some of the regulations that were helping. Uh, to establish new companies and uh, some other uh, indicators that were important for uh, doing business uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, 
thanks uh, and but all this was understood that the country needed changes but it uh, it took transition of power in 2016 to initiate more comprehensive approach to the process of economic modernization it was from the position of stability but also a sense of urgency that the newly elected president Brizio started implementing reforms president Brizio had a very good idea of where to start since he um, some of these reforms actually were designed during his tenure as prime minister and they only required political will to be implemented. <coughs> On October 5, 2016, uh, still uh, acting president, uh, Mirzeu, signed a decree on additional measures to ensure the accelerated development of entrepreneurship, the full protection of private property, and the qualitative improvement of the business environment. This initiative sent a clear signal uh, uh, as, the, as of the, his priorities. An understanding that the private sector will be the key driver for economic growth and job creation uh, in Uzbekistan going forward. In February 2017, Uzbekistan adopted 2017-2021 National Development Strategy, which identified five priority areas. I repeat them because I think it's good, good to remind ourselves what are the priority areas for this development strategy. Reform of public administration, reform of the judiciary, strengthening the rule of law and the parliamentary reforms, reforms in economic development and liberalization, focusing on modernization of Uzbek's agriculture and industry, and oriented uh, towards greater comp competitiveness of the products and services. Social reforms based on higher uh, incomes and better jobs, oriented on uh, high quality healthcare, education, housing, etc. And reforms in the security area, focusing on improvements to ensure domestic stability and balanced and constructive foreign policy uh, with the ultimate goal of strengthening uh, independence and sovereignty. <coughs> Following this strategy, President Mizio has signaled new uh, directions in both foreign economic relations and domestic economic policy. The areas were well chosen, the adoption of foreign exchange controls and the high cost of conducting international trade were the two outstanding flaws in the economy. And most significant reform came in September 2017 when the Central Bank of Uzbekistan unified Uzbekistan's exchange rates. And government promised freely floating market determined rates for the future. Simultaneously, restrictions were lifted for legal entities and individuals to convert currency. I have to mention that I had a conversation before before mm -hmm. uh, the seminar today and we learned that I learned it was good news that there are already interesting examples of uh, high volume transfer repatriation of capital from Uzbekistan by investors including at the range of uh, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars so cases are already there that this system is already in, uh, in, act uh, in active several other significant legislative and regulatory initiatives were taken in the first 18 months of presidency on June 21, 2017, the decree on measures, measures of further support domestic exporting organizations and improve foreign economic activities sought to remove artificial restrictions on foreign trade, including by abolishing uh, US agro exports monopoly on the export of agricultural products beginning on July 1, 2017, and by allowing all businesses to engage in export. In a related move, more than 30 regulatory acts were passed <coughs> to reduce barriers in in the tourism sector, including the resolution of August 16, 2017, on priority measures for the development of tourism in 2018-2019. Those measures included, by the way, uh, liberalization of visa regime, uh, allowing citizens of certain countries to enter Uzbekistan for 30 days visa-free, and some almost 40 countries to have very simplified uh, uh, measures, uh, I mean procedures to get visa. Uh, it's a track, uh, track different from what was happening uh, several, a couple of years ago. In September 2017, presidential decree on measures to further streamline the foreign economic activity of the Republic of Uzbekistan sharply reduced customs duties on more than 8,000 categories of imported goods. This included uh, zero rates on customs payments for uh, more than 3,500 items and the modest excise tax for uh, more than 1,000 items. The average customs uh, rate for imported goods was now established at 6.45%. In 
In the area of taxation, first presidential decree was issued in July 2007, and there were several other legislative acts adopted in end of 2017 and then in February 2018. This is work in progress, but clearly there is, a, there is already a sign of simplification of the procedures, and I think uh, there will be more uh, to come in this direction. Again, it's a, it's a work, in, uh, work, work in progress. This and other measures set, uh, re uh, set reform priorities and provide governmental entities with immediate action plans. Some of the policies are already beginning to bring positive results in the form of growing exports, increased foreign direct investments, and increased number of new jobs. Trade turnover with foreign uh, countries increased by over 11% in 2017, with exports growing by more than 15% and uh, imports by more than 7%. Uh, Based on different estimates, about 400,000 uh, new jobs were created in 2017. President Missouri's first 18 months was marked with many international visits uh, that enabled the new president to establish relations with leaders of neighboring states and uh, great, greater, uh, great economic powers. President Missouri's outreach to Uzbekistan's neighbors signaled the shift in policies and priorities. And the meetings with Turkmen, Kazakh, and Tajik leaders in particular highlighted connectivity and hence Uzbekistan's reintegration into regional economic circle. This has begun to deliver results, including new direct air connections looking, uh, linking Tashkent uh, to Dushanbe and Kabul, uh, greatly facilitating travel, opening more border crossings, uh, as well as growing trade figures. Uzbekistan is making progress in reforming governance and public services, taking steps uh, that are having an impact on the lives of ordinary citizens and makes it easier for businesses to operate. As a result of those reforms, the country has moved up to 74th place in the World Bank's doing business ranking from 87th in 2015 and 146 in 2013. According to our colleagues from the World Bank, the improvement in, in, this, uh, in the past year we adopted in the following five areas. Starting business, 11th in the world, highest ranking uh, Uzbekistan has in the doing business. Dealing with uh, construction permits, protecting minority investors, paying taxes, and getting electricity. Uh, in the uh, area of paying taxes, the number of payments required to comply with tax requirements have been significantly reduced from 75, 75 years ago to 10 now, which surpasses the average of 11 payments in OECD high, uh, high income countries. One of the uh, one area uh, that, is, that needs to be also emphasized that uh, Uzbekistan really needed decentralization. And most of the decisions, whether it's permits or regulations, are adopted at the level of, of central government. And if you look at the, at the, at the number of licenses uh, that are issued by central government versus local governments, the ratio is 90 to uh, 10. And, and this, this also refers to different construction and other kind, kind of permits. So the centralization process is already taking place and there are several measures that are introduced to accelerate that process. Uh, reform was actually, uh, reforms has reached the cotton sector as well. The ban on child labor in cotton uh, picking was broadened to include education and health workers. And in September 2017, the government actually ordered all forced labor to be sent home. As a result, wage increase may make cotton picking more attractive to voluntary labor, while mechanization is also being considered. These reform policies were positively assessed by our colleagues from uh, all of them, I mean, not just cotton, uh, by our colleagues from uh, International Monetary Fund and other financial, financial institutions. Uh, I'm sure uh, Mr. Yadio will talk about some of the <coughs> statements and some of the points of the statements from from, uh, uh, from two recent missions into Uzbekistan in the last four or five months. Uh, the experience of uh, past months is encouraging, but Uzbekistan's reforms are at the initial stage, and they, uh, the issue, the key issue, how successful uh, the administration will be in implementing these systemic reforms. The initial steps have yet to create free pricing and competition in fuel, because uh, centralized management and pricing system remains in place, where uh, centralized uh, management and pricing remains in place. This example highlights that multifaceted uh, uh, needs, uh, if, uh, in order to 
uh, the reforms to succeed, they used to be uh, orchestrated, well orchestrated, multifaceted approach to all the areas of economic activity, and not limited to one or, uh, one or two or three areas of activities. In general, economic reforms really yield, obviously, immediate uh, benefits and require some degree of patience. The uh, timing of uh, reforms uh, is also interesting because of, uh, of what is happening in, in, the, in terms of regional developments, in terms of uh, Belt and Road Initiative coming from China, attempts by uh, partners and neighbors of uh, Uzbekistan to accelerate uh, better connectivity between uh, regional countries, but better and greater regionalism in trade and transit and, and uh, other economic activities that will engage not only immediate neighbors of, of, uh, of Uzbekistan, but also countries that, uh, that include India, China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and of course uh, partners from Caucasus states. In sum, in, uh, in about 18 months, President Mirziol outlined a very ambitious reform agenda and started to implement, implement it. He undertook a full travel and meeting schedule to restore the country's international links and, in particular, to repair Uzbekistan's fractured relationship with its Central Asian neighbors. He removed a milestone around Uzbekistan's economy by unifying the exchange rates and liberalized access to foreign exchange. Even though it is too early to draw definite conclusions, these steps appear to have been uh, demonstrating very significant shift from control to greater confidence in market mechanisms. An important signal that Uzbekistan is more open for business would be to complete negotiations with uh, accession to the World Trade Organization and a uh, recent meeting in, in, uh, uh, in Tashkent on March 13 with all the donor institutions uh, to define the roadmap to the membership of WTO, uh, 34 point map, uh, roadmap, and uh, it's in the process of implementation currently. If Tashkent stays on course and liberalizes all prices, restructures state-owned enterprises, improves governance, encourages foreign direct investments, opens trade and invests in greater connectivity with uh, neighbors, the payoff from this shift could be large, directly reflecting on job creation and the greater prosperity for citizens of Uzbekistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I am very optimistic about Uzbekistan. Uh, I started to uh, travel to Uzbekistan sometime, I think it was July of 2015. And I'll give you a little, some personal anecdotes. I don't have any uh, prepared comments with an outline. But I, I think I'll give you a little bit of jest about one of my impressions of Uzbekistan and why I'm a bit optimistic about uh, the future of Uzbekistan. I was there, uh, as I mentioned, in 2015. I wasn't there to advise on any particular topic. Uh, I was there actually doing a research for a book that I wrote um, uh, called Risk and Returns, uh, Financial Sector Development in Europe and Central Asia. And Uzbekistan and a lot of the other Central, country, uh, uh, Central Asian economies were part of this uh, study, just doing a little background about what the state of the financial sector was. So uh, I didn't know much about Uzbekistan when I landed. Uh, it was the first time I'd been in the country. Uh, got to the Radisson Blue, which was the hotel to stay at, and I went there. Um, and I uh, figured I, I better get some local currency. So uh, I went to the front desk. I said, is there an ATM around? Because usually you go to the ATM and get local currency. Uh, so the, the lady behind the desk said, yes, it's right around the, the other side of the, the counter here. She walked with me around the counter. I put my ATM card and went in, and uh, I saw two numbers pop up, about 150. So I go, well, I better take 100 because I'll be here for about five days, and I don't know, what, you know how much things cost. So I, I, I put my, you know, punch of the number and got 100. I thought it was going to be the local currency, <coughs> but it turned out to be a $100 bill. 
which wasn't much use because I wanted local currency. So I went back to the front desk. The, uh, the, the receptionist had uh, followed me behind her and she said, well, we have an exchange window right there. Uh, you can exchange the $100 uh, from the desk. So I went to the, the exchange desk. I gave uh, the woman behind the desk the $100. And uh, she looks it up, she looks at it in the, 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 the light and she sees there's a crease in the middle of the $100 bill. She goes, I'm sorry, but no, I can't accept. I can't accept it. And then the woman from behind the reception comes in, starts arguing with her in Russian, which I don't speak. And uh, no way, she wasn't budging. There was a crease in the middle of the $100 bill. She wasn't going to accept the $100 bill. So the lady behind the desk comes, psst, psst. She goes, I, we can exchange at the bazaar. And I'll get a taxi for you. I go, OK, uh, I'll go. And so I, I saw the exchange window. It was 2400 some per dollar at the time. Uh, that they were going to exchange my uh, per dollar um, uh, uh, for at the exchange rate. So uh, I, my colleague there, who's, who speaks Russian, uh, Konstantin, uh, he, I said, you know, you want to go with me to the bazaar? I, I guess they have some exchange houses over there, uh, and we can exchange the dollars. And she goes, yeah, I need some local currency as well. So the tax picks us up, drives us to the bazaar. Before we get out of the car, a guy comes in with a satchel. And he exchanges our money right there. Uh, I thought it was going to be, I thought it was going to be rough, but uh, quite fortunately for us, uh, the realization was that the exchange, the official exchange rate, was a lot different than the parallel rate. I think the parallel rate at the time was about seven thousand so per dollar. The official rate was uh, around, well, maybe it was five thousand, and the official rate was about twenty four hundred. And, and you um, would have done better at using Uzbek. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I took whatever I could get. I, I, I was really, uh, uh, very grateful that I could exchange the money and because it had a crease in the middle of the, the bill. There. So um, that was the first kind of ex you know, impression I got. This is a really you know, repressed financial system. Uh, and uh, I have to figure this out. Anyway, my main goal was not to deal with the exchange rate. It was to really find out about you know, how do people get credit, how do people say, what's the pension system like? Uh, anything to do with financial sector development, broadly defined, not just credit, but... So I, I talked to a lot of different um, credit organizations and realizing that a lot of it was uh, you know, centrally uh, organized, a lot of it was directed lending, not too much was involved with you know, private individuals coming up and getting loans for a business. So uh, my last meeting was with the Central Bank, and uh, the Central Bank meeting was very much uh, uh, very well orchestrated. Um, there was, you know, I asked them about the financial system. I learned that I wasn't there to advise or to, to give them any recommendations, but I asked them. So, uh, do you have an aspiration? Do you aspire to be, you know, in China? Or do you aspire to be Singapore? Do you aspire to be? You know, closer to or emulate the economies of uh, maybe Latin America. What what is your model? And, uh, and the, the person behind uh, the, on the other side of the table said, "No, we have the Uzbek model, right? That's our model. We don't aspire to be anybody else." You go, okay. I said, "There's also one other thing I wanted to ask you about. Was you know, the exchange rate seems to be quite distorted." Um, and I, I said, "You know, I, I, I tried to uh, exchange the dollar bill at the window of the hotel." And they sent me to the bazaar, and I was able to get twice the amount of currency, at, you know, per dollar, local currency per dollar, at the bazaar than at the official rate. And I said, are, at some point, are you guys thinking about this at all? And, and he goes, no. what do you mean? Uh, there is no parallel market rate. What are you talking about? I said, yeah, I mean, everybody was using the, the, this uh, other exchange rate. And he dismissed it as being, uh, you know, uh, only used for drug dealers and uh, illicit <laughs> activities, and it was completely uh, a, a very small portion of the economy, very, very minor. Now, take that up to, um, you know, 2017, uh, and uh, the world has completely changed. Um, before the uh, the devaluation. Uh, and the liberalization of the exchange rate, um, we had a meeting with the government, and um, it was still at the initial stages. Uh, the president in Israel had his five points, as you mentioned, of, of, of opening up, 
and uh, we wanted to engage on those five points and uh, look towards uh, modifying uh, our strategy with Uzbekistan. Prior to that, we were mainly uh, financing schools and infrastructure projects, uh, transport. And, um, you know, at the end of the conversation, he goes, let's have a, a series of workshops where we can have a dialogue about, you know, some of the kind of broader structural forms and how Uzbekistan might change. And uh, one of those uh, workshops was about uh, other countries' experiences with exchange rate regimes. Uh, and uh, a lot of the discussion was about, you know, how can we move towards gradual, you know, liberalization of the exchange rate. Um, quite to our surprise, the following uh, September, uh, this year, uh, they liberalized the exchange rate. I mean, just, you know, very quickly. Uh, and uh, it has been, you know, uh, a tremendous kind of running to catch up uh, with the Uzbeks on how fast they're moving. Now, um, a lot of the things that they have aspirations for, and were mentioned in this paper, uh, are true, and they are certainly are moving forward on, on all of them, but the, the process is a lot more difficult than you know, signing a decree. Obviously, there's a lot of interest groups that uh, the government is having to manage and deal with. I would say that uh, a lot of the reforms um, are you know, two steps forward, one step back sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's two steps forward, two steps back. But as you mentioned, uh, we are at the early stages of the process. So uh, it's um, exhausting. I think the, uh, the sense that we get from the general uh, business community and the population on the street is uh, a great deal of optimism. Uh, we're optimistic as well. Um, uh, we are, as I mentioned, trying to keep up with the pace of things and also support the government on its strategy. So, as you mentioned, we were there with them uh, to help with the, the, the WTO uh, strategy going forward. Uh, we're helping them um, on strategies and, and, uh, along with the IMF on uh, tax reforms. Uh, we're helping them in a variety of ways, uh, getting their uh, vision implemented, and it's a, it's a complicated process. It's kind of like, you know, trying to build, you know, one of these, um, you know, Lego structures, and how do you, which piece do you put down first so the whole structure maintains its integrity? You know, at the same time, there's a risk that if you get, if you don't, if you're missing one of the, the blocks, uh, the other side of the structure can to topple over and not go in the direction that you want it to. They are very deliberate, uh, and they're trying to be very thoughtful, and uh, that's, I think, the, the, in summary, what I wanted to say. Open up for questions later on. Thank you very much, David Cool. I, I, uh, your final comment reminded me of something you might have noticed in the last few weeks. And, uh, someone was pondering the difference in the salary between a heart surgeon and, a, and an auto mechanic, and the, and, and, uh, the mechanic asked the servant, uh, the, the surgeon, uh, why are you being paid 17 times more than I'm being paid? He said, have you ever tried to fix an auto engine when, it, when the car is running? And, and, and that's the, the complexity of this, of this, is that there is a day-to-day -day working economy, and, and you can't just stop it and repair everything and start it again at some future point. But on a daily basis, it's functioning. Albert Yeager. Very pleased to have you here. It's a, we, I should say, one, we're very proud to have, over many years, had a, a, a very successful uh, a link with the uh, International Monetary Fund, which does these very careful studies, and, and twice a year they've presented them at the Central Asia Conference and Institute. Mario Snyder, who helped set the, this up years ago, is here today. Uh, this is a, a very valuable source of, of really authoritative data on, on the regional economies. Anyone interested in Central Asia, the caucuses should be following those reports, which we do present here on a regular basis. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, uh, Fred and Mamuka, to organize this event. Um, I think Mamuka's paper gives an excellent overview, uh, both of the history of the Uzbek economy and the strategy that has been adopted recently by the new Uzbek leadership. I will not too much uh, comment on, on the 
Mamuka's paper. Um, I want to focus on one, just one topic, and that is the question: Why, why did we see this change in policy, uh, policy reversal, as, as you could call it, uh, uh, recently in uh, Uzbekistan? As Mamuka mentioned before, this wasn't quite expected. Uh, I think even by people who were working on Uzbekistan or who were watching the region quite carefully. And as I understand, that's not unusual for policy reversals. Uh, most big policy reversals come unannounced and, uh, and, they, and they just happen. Um, let, let me just, before, before I start uh, with uh, going into my topic, uh, we will have a report on Uzbekistan coming out in about one month from now. Uh, it is our Article 4 report. Uh, we, have, we had a delay, we, have a, we had three years delay <laughs> in getting this report out. Uh, but in about a month, we should have that report, and that report should discuss uh, very much in detail uh, the various policy recommendations uh, that we have uh, for Uzbekistan. Okay, uh, let me start. So, first of all, when you think about Uzbekistan, I think people need to be aware of the demographics of the country. And the demographics is it's not just that the population is growing relatively fast and that you have a growing labor supply. Uzbekistan is in a rather special uh, demographic situation right now. Uh, this has, of course, happened in many other countries. In some countries, the situation has already passed. So what happened is, after World War II, there was a rapid decline in fertility rates and mortality rates, and something we have seen in many other countries. This, with a lag, leads usually to an increase in the population at working age, and then you have this special demographic window that usually lasts for about two generations where the share of your population that is available to work is very high. And that is usually a time period when a country has a unique opportunity to develop and to grow. Um, on the slide I put one of the classic references on on demographic transitions and growth uh, to people from, I guess, who worked at that time at the World Bank. At the same time, demographic windows are very challenging because if the country does not generate jobs and does not grow, you will have high unemployment, people will have to migrate out to find jobs, and people may not be very happy in their country. So on the one hand, it's a great opportunity, but on the other hand, it is, it, it is as well a challenge. Let me move to my next slide. Now, <clears throat> when you ask the question, why, why did this happen? Why do we see this change? Um, first, we, we need to understand or have an idea what USPEC development model was. Um, as was already explained, this was very much a state-led economic model. The state was very much in charge of, of pretty much everything. And at the same time, it was also a very inward-looking model. It was heavily based on import substitution, on exchange rate restrictions, and also trade restrictions. So what effectively happened with the economy was that it was segregated in two basic sectors. First you had the privileged sector, that's where the state companies operated, and those businesses that were well connected in the country. So this was the privileged sector, and then <coughs> Besides that, you had another sector. These were mainly small informal companies that had to 
to survive in a relatively disadvantaged uh, setting. Now, <clears throat> we have two narratives why policies were changed. Narrative one is that the Uzbek model worked reasonably well for some time, but it got exhausted. And that's why it's time to change policies. And there is another, but there is another narrative that would argue that Uzbek model never really worked that well as it was advertised, uh, particularly by the Uzbeks. I will try to argue that narrative, the second narrative, is the correct one. So, two years ago, if you would go to Uzbekistan as a, as a macroeconomist, and you would look around what's going on in the economy, and you would look at the standard indicators of the economy, you would find a picture that looks almost perfect. What macroeconomists are supposed to do usually is they have first to look at is this economy externally stable? You, when you looked at the Uzbek data, everything looked fine. The country was running external current account surpluses, the foreign exchange reserves were going up each year, so external stability in very good shape. Then you look next at internal stability, which is basically about inflation. What you would find is the government announces a target range for inflation one year in advance, and the reported consumer price inflation is always at the bottom of that, exchange, of that target range. I mean, this is the dream of any inflation targeter. It's, 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 it's perfection. Next, you look at the growth rate. The growth rate is, is pretty high. It was always about 8%. And what was even more striking was the government would announce the growth rate one year in advance, and there was no error. I mean, yeah. this, this made astronomy look imprecise in many ways. Uh, so, for, for people who want to see successful economic forecasting, this, this, was, this was perfection. Now, so if you look at the standard indicators, everything looked perfect. Nothing to criticize from there. What about reforms? I think Mamuka mentioned that Uzbekistan had a lot of success in improving their doing business indicator. Uh, the doing business indicator is done by the World Bank. Um, I have here the, the list of the sub indicators uh, for doing business. So from 2014 to 2017, we see Uzbekistan going basically from way back, at least to the middle, to the middle of the pack, which, which is an amazing achievement. Uh, and I think it was already mentioned that Uzbekistan even passed the United States on some of these doing business indicators, uh, including starting a business and getting electricity. So again, if you just take this at face value, you would say this is, these, are, these, are, these are impressive, these are impressive reforms. So when you see these uh, indicators, you would ask yourself, of course, this cannot, I mean, this cannot be the whole story. And when you start looking at, when you start looking around, you could easily quickly find there were some flaws. In the foreign exchange market, it was not very difficult uh, to, to figure that out, as, as David explained. Uh, when he was trying to exchange uh, dollars uh, for local currency, there was a black market uh, in place, and 
The black market exchange rate was usually much more depreciated than the official exchange rate. And especially after 2014, when uh, Uzbekistan was hit by some uh, adverse external shocks, uh, lower commodity prices, lower demand for the exports, lower remittances, the black market rate started to shoot up. <coughs> and uh, at some point, it was more than 100% uh, above the official exchange rate, which is a huge spread, uh, which suggests there's certainly something wrong in the foreign exchange market. On inflation, when you looked around and you looked at other price indicators, you quickly found that the official consumer price index was pretty low, I mean, reported pretty low inflation. Um, we, we had our own alternative consumer price index, which had much higher inflation rates. And if you looked at the producer price index, which for some reason was published, you would see that inflation rates were even much higher. And if that was not enough, you just had to look at the denominations of the banknotes. Um, when I was in Uzbekistan two years ago, the highest denomination banknote was a 5,000 Zoom bill. Um, right now, they have a 50,000 Zoom bill as the highest denomination. And I think they're going to print uh, an even higher uh, denomination note soon. And if you go to a restaurant and you want to pay your bill, a normal restaurant bill, you will have a big bundle of banknotes. You will need a big bundle of banknotes uh, to go with you. On GDP, we also had our doubts uh, whether this, uh, these GDP growth numbers uh, make much sense. Uh, one divergence we, we observed was that when we looked at electricity consumption in the country, we, we didn't see going it up. So this was all growth that seemed to require no energy at all. And so that, that also raised questions about uh, the GDP uh, numbers. <clears throat> what about those reforms that uh, looked so impressive. Uh, now, when you look at the World Bank's doing business indicator, what you have to keep in mind is uh, this reflects what is on paper. So this is what is in regulations and what is in the laws. That doesn't mean that if de facto investment climate follows what's on paper, Now, in this chart, what I was trying to do is I put on the vertical axis the doing business indicator rank of some 100, I think it's about 190 countries. On the horizontal axis, I have the rank of the country using the corruption perception index. Now, I'm using that one as an indicator of the de facto investment climate. Uh, it's of course not a perfect indicator of that, but it is based on perceptions. It's not based on what's on paper. Now, these two indicators, obviously, you would expect to be quite correlated. Countries that are doing well on doing business should also do well on uh, corruption perceptions. Um, but when you look at the diagram, one thing you will notice immediately when you look at Uzbekistan in 2013 and Uzbekistan in 2017, you see that the movement in the doing business is accompanied by no movement in the corruption perception. So we are basically moving vertically on, on, on the doing business indicator. Now, I should note that this delinking between what's on paper and what is the de facto investment climate may be a problem in the region as a, as a whole. It's, it's not a Uzbek specific problem. Uh, you can see the Central Asian and Caucasus countries there. Uh, 
they all tend to be to the right of of of, of the of the main of the main line. Um, so this may be a more general problem. It's not just an issue in, in, in Uzbekistan. Can I just uh, uh, maybe Actually, the doing business indicator shouldn't be just what's on paper. Uh, it should actually reflect a survey as well. But the problem is, is that you're dealing with the formal sector, the people that you can actually talk to. And that is highly dependent upon the selection of the survey group that you have. So I think the same problem exists, but uh, the, you, you have the disconnect between you know, the individuals that you survey and actually what is the, you know, coming out of the economy. So it's, it's an issue. Sure. Okay, <clears throat> some more observations that uh, shed out on the Uzbek model. Um, here I have for few, a few countries in, 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 in the region and the neighborhood uh, per capita income using purchasing power parities starting in 1995 uh, to 2016. Um, Uzbekistan had an explicit ambition or aspiration here. Uh, they wanted to catch up with upper middle income countries, uh, basically reaching upper middle income status. When you look when you look at the lines, you can see that Uzbekistan, despite the reported high real GDP growth rates, was diverging increasingly from that aspiration. Um, one country that is interesting in the chart is obviously China. China started exactly at the same per capita income level in 1995 as, as Uzbekistan. And uh, China made it, basically. They, they caught up uh, with the upper middle income countries. I sh should say that Uzbekistan did better than some of the other economies in the region. And as you can see, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are uh, significantly uh, below Uzbekistan there in per capita incomes. Now, what we think is or was the biggest flaw of the Uzbek model was job creation. When you look at the labor market data, and those data are by no means uh, perfect data, of course. And here we compare what were, what were the employment figures in 2007 with 2017. These are their official figures. We can see, first of all, the working age population increased very rapidly. Uh, we know that. That's the demographic transition part. The official employment uh, numbers, uh, this is in millions, uh, millions of uh, jobs, increased also substantially, uh, 2.8 million is, is, not, is, is not little. But then you have to realize that the official employment figures include the migrants uh, for some reason, which we, we have never quite figured out why they do that. Uh, if you take out the migrants, and these are registered migrants, these are not the, these are probably not the correct migrant figures because those figures must be much higher. We know the remittances, and uh, it cannot be uh, that we have only about 1.3 million migrants. Uh, there must be much more. Finally, when we exclude from the employment figures, not just the migrants, but we also include the informal workers. These are, these are unregistered businesses. These are really very, very small businesses. And there are lots of them. We end up with employment creation figures that are really quite, quite small. Over 10 years, 1.2 million. Um, with the working age population going up by 4.4 million. <coughs> Interestingly enough, and I told you about the segregation of the economy into two sectors, 
when you look at the sector, uh, the employment in the large companies, which are the state-owned enterprises, and you include the budgetary organizations, you will see that they didn't create, in net terms, any jobs over those 10 years. Uh, if anything, the number of jobs went down. So we had, in, when we look at job creation, we have a disappointing picture in terms of the number of jobs, but also we have a very disappointing picture in terms of the quality of jobs that were created. Because job creation was very much concentrated in very small companies, many of them informal. Okay, so let me just summarize. Uh, the Uzbek model uh, looked pretty good on paper. Uh, no, no, no question about that. But when you would look at it a bit more closely, and you would find big flaws. And I, I, I was trying to explain some of those flaws. Now, given that, I think there is no surprise, or there should not be a surprise, why the leadership in Uzbekistan changed gears uh, about a year ago. And I hope I was able to convince you it was not because they thought the development model had worked extremely well so far. They had to change models because the model was exhausted. I think they became convinced that their model doesn't work. And I think that's, that augurs well for the future because I think that will give them an incentive to stick to their uh, new reform agenda. Thank you. I want to thank both of you, David and Albert. This is, this is wonderful. And, and if, if any of you in the room still believe that economics is a dismal science. I think these two presentations should, should cause you to, to rethink that. Uh, it, it's really, for me, very exciting to hear what are two very solidly based and, and clearly serious uh, analyses that, that don't match. And that's a challenge to all of us as observers and analysts to, to to be aware of both as, as, and, and to, to understand the way in which one hy hypothesis or another uh, explains or doesn't explain uh, ongoing development. So uh, I'm not, I'd like to suggest that we, that, we, that we focus particularly on the reforms here and feel free to harken back to these two perspectives. Uh, in any way you wish. But the floor is now open, and both of our uh, uh, commenters and Mamuka uh, Saratelli uh, uh, will be at your service. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. This is very interesting. Uh, my name is Jet Thomasin from State Department, uh, former Peace Corps of Pakistan. I uh, 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 Bukhara, Kishdaman. Yeah, Kishashli. Um, <laughs> if I could ask a question about who's getting credit for new businesses. You talked about the segregation of this sort of a formal sector, large companies, well, connected companies, I think especially to politics and public politicians, and then the informal sector. If these reforms are going forward to create businesses so expeditiously and get in electricity, are, they, are, are you able to see small businesses getting credit easily, or is it vested interest, vested companies that have capital that are able to start the business. Thank you. Maybe I'll make a quick comment first and then uh, I'll ask uh, others to ask others. First of all, I think, uh, uh, just to comment on Albert's presentation, we all agree that the uh, system had many uh, problems and issues. and. Uh, what started to occur in 2016 and continued through 2017 is uh, attempt to change the system, modernize it. When we said that there's an element of continuity, 
clearly there is an element of continuity. But some of these reforms were already in design, but the problem was that there was not enough political will to implement them. And now we have political will, starting from 2000, uh, late 2016. So that's, that's an essential element to, uh, to incorporate in our analysis and thinking that, uh, yeah, those, those, those numbers are right, and there are some of the challenges, obviously. By the way, I also wanted to mention that this is, when you look at official statistics of employment and unemployment in every former Soviet Union state, and probably maybe that's the case in other countries as well, official numbers are much lower than what are the, what are the perceptions of employment in, in, in these countries. And why this is the case? People who own little parcel of land and can, can produce something on that land, by official statistics in almost every country, are considered to be employed. And that makes this difference between official numbers in the how many people are employed and some many people are unemployed. Unemployment numbers are very large in all those countries, and they are the biggest challenge that countries have. There's no doubt about it. Going back to the uh, uh, small businesses, we see trend of growth of small businesses and their contribution to GDP. If you trust numbers, whatever numbers are available, there are clearly there's a clear sign of growth of their contribution to both employment and GDP. And uh, I have numbers in the, in the report. Uh, and as, as credits are becoming one of the most important initiatives of the government and efforts that are, uh, that are made focusing with international financial institutions like EBRD and others to pro provide lines of credit for local banks to fund small businesses. And this is a very important effort made by both uh, banks themselves as well as government in terms of facilitation of, of banks' relationships, uh, bank, bank relationship between banks and international financial institutions. Statistics shows greater contribution of small businesses to uh, economic performance. Uh, but clearly there is a larger, in terms of GDP, Large state-owned enterprises are still very, very uh, important contributors to GDP. Albert. Yeah, who's getting credit? <laughs> <laughs> who's getting credit? Okay. <coughs> well, in the credit market is obviously one of these markets that is highly segmented. Uh, so, <coughs> the state state-owned enterprises generally get credit in foreign exchange which is much more favorable. Um, the credit that is extended uh, to the state enterprises is, is often funded by the public sector uh, through the Fund for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, so that's very convenient for the banks. But it also means that the banks are basically told what to do. Uh, it's not like uh, they can make a fully independent evaluation of the investment project. Uh, but at the same time, the risk is on the bank's balance sheet. <laughs> the, funding, the funding comes from the public sector, but the risk is still on the, on the bank's balance sheet. Yeah, I, I, I think this is one of the big, uh, this will be one of the big uh, bottlenecks uh, for the future, for, for, for the growth of the private sector. Uh, that the banking, model, the banking model changes uh, to a model that uh, serves private sector growth and provides credit at, uh, at, uh, at uh, reasonable, at, re at balanced terms. And not, I mean, right now the state on the enterprises get a preferential terms, and you could argue that some of the, uh, uh, some of the low profit profitability of, 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 of those credits has to be made up with the other credit segment, uh, which is largely in domestic currency. Um, so, I mean, the banking sector will have to go uh, through a restructuring. Uh, everybody agrees with that. Uh, that means you have to probably to rationalize. There are too many state-owned state -owned banks operating. They have huge networks, very costly. Um, they may have, they may, they should try to attract foreign expertise on, on banking. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, uh, foreign banks have difficulties operating in the region as a whole, and 
it's also difficult for them to operate uh, in Uzbekistan. David Gould, how do you see this evolution? Yeah, so I, uh, I agree uh, with Albert and Luca. I think um, the only thing that I would add, uh, besides the fact that the majority of the credit has historically been directed and particularly dominated by uh, state-owned enterprises, um, the banks are state-owned primarily as well. So it's basically lending in one government arm lending to another government arm. Um, when I was there uh, you know, two years ago, there were some small you know, businesses that could get loans, but the uh, collateral that was required was over 100%. Uh, the government was very, um, uh, financial supervision was very strict because loan officers could be held accountable for any loans that went under. So there was a very uh, limited amount of credit that was going to kind of non-connected uh, uh, borrowers. That, I think, is uh, probably less uh, important now. What's now more important is just the, the restructuring, as Albert was talking about. I think banks are just uh, kind of keeping the capital very close to their uh, chest because of the risk that they're seeing uh, through the state-owned enterprises as the country is beginning to restructure and the state-owned enterprises may be at more risk uh, now due to the changes in getting the lack of favorable foreign exchange. They can't get any more. Uh, is this a Chinese problem? Uh, I don't think it's gotten to that. No, no but uh, having a big state-owned sector. Absolutely. It's, uh, it is a huge state-owned sector. And it take, it's going to take a while before that becomes uh, opened up. They're not, it's not a big thing to push. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for this very informative presentation and uh, all these uh, insights you gave about Uzbekistan. Uh, I'm from Uzbekistan and uh, I'm uh, here from the Russell Fellowship Program. And I have a question that's more of a problem with the general, but I, I'm a little bit concerned about that, so I decided to ask my experts. My, my question is about the uh, uh, economy, of course, and uh, and one uh, problem that is also very well recognized by the current administration, the current government, is the informal sector. And a lot of people are employed in the informal sector. And we don't really know, and the economists, local economists in Uzbekistan, they cannot really estimate uh, how big this uh, informal sector is. And here, uh, so the country, and it's also kind of the policy recommendations why I am at, I guess, that uh, we have to uh, be a member of the WTO, and it kind of uh, reminds me about the uh, the report that WTO and ILO uh, prepared, uh, they, they published in two, 2007 that says that uh, though the uh, developing countries uh, became uh, kind of they were very much engaged in uh, international trade and the experience grows, but it didn't really reflect it uh, largely in the formal sector and. Uh, around 60% of workers there are still kind of in an unprivileged situation and they don't really benefit from this economic growth. So what is your take on that? And uh, then uh, IMF usually recommends uh, the policy measures on this liberalization and so on. So I've, I've read some articles about that and what you can do is back to some of Why do you think that uh, some policy measures will, will know in Africa they fail they didn't bring this a wealth, but why do you think it will work in Uzbekistan? Just a general question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give a quick take on that. You're, you're giving him time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give a quick take on that. Um, you know, I, I think one of the challenges that um, that everybody should be aware of is, is the managing expectations. And I think uh, there, there isn't really um, an alternative to the path that Uzbekistan has taken over the last year, as Albert and Maluka had spelled out. They were really uh, finding the growth model that they, that they had seen sort of peter out, and it wasn't kind of an alternative. So the alternative of maintaining the status quo wasn't really a, a real alternative. So what is the other alternative? And that was uh, what they have begun 
on this path to take it. Um, that said, um, you know, opening up and liberalizing uh, certainly involves some structural changes. Some people will benefit and some people will lose. And I think that has to be taken into account. The general experience globally has been that liberalization has been a positive net good. And in particularly those countries which have large labor uh, supply. Um, what we're seeing now across the world is a lot of questioning about globalization and about questioning about the benefits of a freer trade. And I think that has mainly come from the advanced countries that uh, where the labor, the lower skilled labor in advanced countries have had to compete a lot with the lower skilled labor in developing countries. So this is likely to be a positive distributional effect for Uzbekistan rather than an adverse distributional effect. That said, there's going to be some labor in SOEs that are going to suffer, but I think the average person, uh, the lower income people, the bottom 40 that the World Bank particularly is concerned about, will see a net benefit because uh, the price of exports in the agriculture sector were uh, kept lower than the global average through the official exchange rate being much lower than the parallel rate. Um, that was an implicit tax. Another implicit tax was surrender requirements and things like that that have been done away with. So given these opportunities for agriculture, which is a huge employer of the lower income groups, I think that for overall Uzbekistan is likely, at least the distribution wise, is likely to benefit. Very interesting. Yes, I've got a quick, quick comment before we <coughs> just to give a bit more time to think. Uh, since you mentioned the informal economy, I think it's essential to remember that as long as doing business in informal economy is cheaper than doing business in formal sector, people will be in informal economy. And what this government is trying right now with all these regulatory and other reforms is actually to make it cheaper, cost effective to operate in the legal framework. And this is a trend that is emerging and that's what we need to kind of uh, recognize and support. So that's the only path to eliminate informal economy to make it cheaper in a legal sector. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <coughs> informal sector is very big, as, 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 as you know. Um, um, actually, the statisticians in Uzbekistan are trying to estimate the size of employment in the informal sector. They, they use household service. Uh, so there, there is a real attempt to estimate that part of find out how big that part of the economy is. Uh, now, uh, exports, will, will this be a source, uh, will, will exports help? Uh, probably not. I, I don't think uh, informal companies are good export companies usually. Uh, we know export companies are very specific types of companies. Uh, they usually are high productivity, they are pretty focused, high profitability. So they, they usually operate in the former sector. Even among the even among neighbors. Well, you mean you mean border well, trade? Yeah, border trade. Well, maybe small border trade could be done by informal companies. But if, if you want to export in, in a big way, uh, you better be a former company. Uh, I think the final question was, will it work this time? Uh, I mean, again, I think all these reforms are about leveling the playing field. Uh, between what used to be the privileged sector and, and the rest of the economy, which is much bigger than the privileged sector. And leveling the playing field goes across all areas. I mean, the foreign exchange reform leveled the playing field as regards access to foreign exchange. But we still have to level the playing field for the credit market. Uh, on competition, there is still, I mean, if, if you're connected to a state-owned enterprise, you're basically a monopoly. Uh, so there's no competition domestically. And there's very little competition coming from abroad. Uh, so these reforms, in a way, are all about leveling the playing field. Uh, and 
I hope you pretty optimistic. Uh, I, I don't know Uzbekistan that long, but knowing Uzbek history, I, I, I think this is, this is this is the country in the region which which has the aspiration to do better. I, I don't see why it should work. Here's a very interesting detail from the World Bank study from 2017, and I, uh, then I added a uh, number for 2017. By 2017, Uzbekistan uh, exported fruits and vegetables to 43 countries. And the value of these exports increased by 38% in 2016, and based on the most recent data, 50% in 2017. So these are interesting numbers by itself, the geography of the Just as an anecdote, I was in Kiev, in the restaurant, and uh, they had this excellent uh, tomato dish. And I said, these are, these are delicious tomatoes. And the uh, waitress said, yes, we get them from Uzbekistan. So uh, they were, obviously they are exporting, um, and I think it's a potential, a uh, huge growth area for them in the horticultural products. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Suskandar. I'm uh, from Kazakhstan. I also present the Ramsal Fellow here. Uh, my question is to Mr. Alba Yager, if I'm correct. Uh, Uzbekistan for the two last years has been uh, the biggest news maker in the region. So uh, the opening up and the, the so-called liberalization, which is going on. Um, don't you think that we sometimes overestimate what's happening uh, in Uzbekistan and at the same time overestimating the uh, regional aspect of the kind of integration in economic terms. So uh, if you are, if for example, I'm an investor and I'm planning to invest into Uzbekistan, how do I need to operate in a kind of this new environment uh, in economic sense? Well, uh, <laughs> Still a difficult investment environment. When you looked at those charts on the investment climate, maybe in doing business it looks better, but it's, it's uh, pretty sure you will have a hard time as an investor, but you could have a high payoff as well. Um, in, in terms of what's happening, are we overestimating what's happening? Uh, clear, clearly, there is a pace of reforms taking place here that is, is uh, you, could, you could argue, maybe a bit too fast. Because the administrative machinery can barely keep up with <laughs> uh, the reforms that are kind of decreed uh, almost weekly. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't take at face value each decree that comes out each week and announces a new reform of this and that. Uh, but I think in terms of the regional uh, cooperation, or the change in the regional approach of Uzbek, I, I think that's a huge change. Uh, that's what everybody says. This is vis-a-vis uh, -vis all the neighbors, uh, including Afghanistan. They they are taking a very very different approach now, and and that's a big game change. I, I I would think. Interesting news from today, actually, for after long delay, a long pause. Uh, today, uh, actually yesterday, they resumed export of natural gas to uh, Tajikistan. So uh, I think that's just one detail and indication that things are moving to the right direction. And uh, just to, uh, to, to know the question is, uh, is it too optimistic? And I think I, I mentioned earlier that, that a challenge is to manage expectations. And I think there's a lot of real things that are going well. You cannot deny that. Uh, Albert mentioned, you know, it, and I agree with it 100 percent, is that uh, you know things of the, that you can announce and actually getting implemented is another thing. I don't have any uh, questions that there will be ongoing progress. The question is, might there be a little bit too much frothy expectations? Uh, I think there might be. Uh, a lot of positive news tends to generate real excitement, and a reflection of that. Uh, a neighbor of mine who uh, is a, an attorney who works with firms looking to invest a, abroad, and I was talking to him about, I've been traveling to Uzbekistan, and he said, oh, you know, a guy just came into my office. Uh, he wants to open McDonald's in Uzbekistan. <laughs> so uh, just then, you know, I realized, you know, there probably is a lot of, uh, a lot of like, 
high expectations, but you know you have to manage those. Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Firestone from the law firm Baker and McKenzie, and I want to say we have a lot of clients that are looking to do things exactly like what you're talking about. And what Dr. Saratelli said rings very true with our client experience over the past couple of years. We had um, the client was actually able to convert $200 million in currency um, a few months ago. And since that time, since they opened things up, other clients were able, it's just not a problem anymore, which I think is changing things dramatically. But my question really goes to something that um, Dr. Yeager mentioned just now, which is the um, Uzbekistan's regional um, aspirations in terms of economic development. When I was there recently, about two weeks ago, they were holding a big conference on security in Afghanistan, which made me think, well, it's obvi obviously they have security interests there, but there's also economic aspirations in Afghanistan. I'm wondering if you could all talk about how you see um, Uzbekistan's foreign economy. We've talked a lot about the domestic economic reasons. How is that going to spill over into um, the foreign um, economic relations, specifically in Afghanistan? Uh, I'll comment very briefly on that. Uh, this conference that took place was really a very important event uh, because up to now, even though every Central Asian country has been in fact deeply involved with Afghanistan, if you look at Turkmenistan with the Happy Project, which they've pursued for 20 years, Kazakhstan is, has had a, a, a business office and, and Kabul for for many years. The, the the foreign minister of Kazakhstan, in as early as 2005, makes a big trip down there and participates in a conference on, on regional connectivity and so on. Uh, first to do so, by the way. Um, Kyrgyzstan was has been busy promoting the Casa 1000 with the with the World Bank and uh, other other funders. Uh, it's also was busy during throughout the last 15 years trying to sell products for as diverse as, as mineral water and, and, and cement to Afghanistan and the Uzbeks, you know, the railroad, uh, largely funded through ADB, uh, and then their historic uh, ethnic connection with the large Uzbek population around Mazar Sharif, and, and now their continuation of that, they're providing electricity to Kabul and so on. They've all been deeply involved. But on the other hand, they, they've all been, to put it bluntly, spooked by the security issue. And so, so yes, we're doing this, but at the same time, we have to be extremely cautious. And, and, and it must be admitted, first, that the kind of inadequate engagement from the from our side it, 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 invitation to them i mean why bring mineral water from switzerland for god's sake when you can get just as good in Kazakhstan? Um, aside from that the other the other reason is frankly a kind of uh, holdover of soviet thinking about afghanistan is the heart of darkness the places only only bad things happen so a certain can, uh, uh, overhang of that continue now, what this, why this conference was such a big deal is that it was, it was it, all Central Asians participated. It was organized by Central Asians. No third, third parties were involved. Uh, and they did it uh, uh, with full backing and support of the United Nations. And it turned out, turned out to be highly successful, not only because they, they they were sober on the security issues, um, and even to the point of saying, look, uh, we acknowledge that President Ghani, who was there, uh, uh, has made a serious proposal, a very serious proposal, and, and the Taliban hasn't refused it yet, <laughs> but they haven't even answered, which is itself a plus. Uh, it obviously has, has set them thinking. But that we stand solidly behind and they spelled out the principles as a group uh, there. Now, that's one reason why I think it's such an important watershed. This was as much a, a, as, as deep a dive into the security issues as has taken place in the last few years. Now, I go many years before that. The other reason is the pervading sense that this is a, an economic zone 
that is part of us, and we are part of them. Uh, and it's not just because there are a few Kyrgyz running around in Northeast <laughs> Afghanistan uh, and, and every other group there, Turkmen there, as I don't know about Cossacks, that's an interesting question. But the fact is, they all simply took it, uh, if you, they, they accepted it as given that Afghanistan and Central Asia are one. Afghanistan isn't a neighbor, it's part of Central Asia, it always has been and so on, and every president has said this officially. Uh, and, and that therefore, we are searching for economic openings. And, and you know, you don't have to be told, Central Asian business guys are, are pretty sharp. Uh, they have a little experience of this, and, and, and they're, they're from every country. I mean, you have, the, you have the, the, the new regional financial center. We don't know how it will come out in, in Astana, but it's a very ambitious program, as we viewed in the context of, of that exact meeting. So I, I think this is, a, again, ex managing expectations, but this is something qualitatively new, and they acted as a unit, all six countries, not five, as the U.S. government recognizes. It, all six countries acted as a unit and declared their intention to continue doing so. So, very big deal. And if you go to Mazar Sharif, which is better connected with with world major external cities than any secondary city in the in the region, including Uzbekistan, it's very well connected by air. If you go there, you'll find a, an Uzbek-speaking business community, they're bilingual, of course, uh, a business community of, of young guys who are extremely active, and they, it's inevitable that the Uzbeks in Uzbekistan, and they will be linking up in investments and projects. It's already going on. So, and you, Mr. Osmani here, can tell us he's from there, and he knows it inside and out. But do you want to comment? No, I think we covered it all. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Oh, I'm, and, and then back here. And then, then that will be. Fine. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nujimal. I'm from Turkmenistan, also Ramsuk uh, uh, here. In so I have a, um, a number of questions. Uh, first is um, um, if there is, a, what, what uh, has, has anything uh, been changed uh, with regard to the access to data? So during your latest, uh, last missions, um, did you have um, access uh, to, to the technology data, whether they were accurate or not? So um, you already mentioned during your presentations that data is a problem. So, um, second question is um, about um, uh, exchange rate unification. As I understand, uh, so um, there was a reform, and uh, uh, the government of Uzbekistan, um, um, it's, is it a fixed exchange rate or it's a, it's a floating? And um, um, and we all, uh, Turkmenistan also passed through such a reform in 2008. And then we unified and uh, denominated the uh, exchange uh, rate, uh, but it was fixed. And we had enough um, uh, foreign exchange reserves uh, to maintain that uh, fixed exchange rate until 2014. So what, what is the situation with, in, in Uzbekistan? Um, they probably, um, with these uh, restrictions, they have accumulated enough foreign exchange whether they will be sufficient to maintain this uh, new exchange rate. The third question about energy subsidies. Um, uh, uh, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan also, um, we, uh, two countries each uh, has very heavy subsidized uh, uh, tariffs, uh, electricity tariffs, gas tariffs, etc. Um, did you make any uh, suggestions with regard to the energy subsidy reform? And what were the implications, social implications um, um, of this reform? Thank you. Thank you. So very quickly, um, I, I, Albert probably will echo some of the same things. 
um, access to data, it's uh, really been a, a sea change. Uh, we have uh, been given a lot more access to data than we ever have been given before. I think the authorities um, have you know, gotten the message from, you know, from the very top that uh, data provision should be a priority. It's still difficult and uh, it's still somewhat imprecise. They, some of the data they just don't have. Uh, but in terms of what they do have, they've been much more willing to share the data. Um, so far, I'll let Albert talk about the exchange rate. In terms of energy subsidies, they have raised tariff rates quite a bit. Um, and uh, some of the energy will be um, uh, uh, marked at, uh, to reflect general costs, not for all businesses, but for many of the sectors. So they're making a, a genuine effort to create uh, financially sustainable uh, uh, energy SOEs. Uzbek Energo, Uzbek Nafta Gas. Uzbek Energo is much more advanced than Uzbek Nafta Gas on its financial recovery plan. Uh, but part of that is due to increasing rates to generally reflect costs. Um, <coughs> I'll let uh, Albert talk about the exchange rate. Okay, thank you. Uh, on access to data, we had always access to data because uh, we have the optics of agreement, and so we are obliged to provide us with the data. Uh, the difficulty was that they didn't want to publish the data. And so I think they may have published one Article 4 report the last 10, 10 15 years. Uh, and as, as you may know, there was, there was a decree from the 1990s which put a lot of economic data as state secrets. Uh, so. And <clears throat> things have changed a lot, as, 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 David, as David already said, but we are in a transition phase right now uh, in terms of adopting different methodologies uh, to, uh, to compile the data. And, so this, this is one of our probably most active technical assistance areas right now. On exchange rate unification, uh, first of all, the, the USPECs themselves don't like it when we say exchange rate unification. They say foreign exchange liberalization because they say they unified the exchange rate before. That's not doing, that doesn't mean much. Uh, you need to liberalize the foreign exchange market. I, you have to abolish surrender requirements. You have, to, you have to abolish the other restrictions. Uh, exchange rate regime right now, uh, on paper, uh, it, it is a managed float. It's classified as a managed float. De facto, since the unification, it was what we call a stabilized arrangement. Uh, so the exchange rate didn't move too much. Uh, it's plus minus 2%. Uh, it's, it's the band, and they have stayed within that. Uh, so right now, it's a stabilized arrangement. But in principle, they say they they want to move to inflation targeting, which, which means they will have to have a more flexible exchange rate in the future. Uh, on subsidies, I, I, I think the really difficult area is natural gas. It's not so much uh, diesel or gasoline or, or, um, or oil, because a lot of that is imported, so that reflects world market prices. But natural gas right now <laughs> is priced. I mean, part is exported, which of course can get the world market price, but most of it is domestically consumed. Uzbek uh, Energo is one of the big, uh, uh, uses a lot of natural gas to, to generate electricity, and that right now is priced at the very, at the very, uh, at the fraction of the world market price. And that's very painful. Uh, is there any thought of changing that? Yeah, yeah. No, they, they, but, they have a strategy for but it's a long way to go. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And many countries have learned not easy path. It's, it's, it's yes, please. Final question. Back. Um, I'm also a Russell fellow from Georgia. Um, as you know, um, Georgian ex-prime minister is now advising Uzbekistan and is advocating for the tax reforms. To, and it, it really worked um, in Georgia, the reforms that he conducted, and he was part of the economic team that took on the reform several years ago. Uh, do you think these um, similar reforms would work in Uzbekistan? 
and it's the tax reforms. And he, in Georgia, took 21 taxes down to six taxes, which really, really helped the economy. general principle of tax simplification is something that we advocate very strongly. And so the fewer tax you know, uh, buckets that you can create and more unified and uh, easy to comply with uh, creates less incentives for corruption, more transparency. Uh, I, I, I you know, rely a lot on uh, the IMF for their tax uh, assessment, and I think uh, I'll let Albert talk about that, but the general uh, feeling is that a gradual movement in that direction rather than the big bang probably is the best strategy and I would agree with that. Uh, <clears throat> tax reform. Look, there are three different issues on, on tax reform. One, one is uh, corporate taxation. Uh, and, and there, maybe it's the Georgian influence, uh, they are thinking about moving to taxing only distributed earnings, but not retained earnings. Um, and should have an open mind about that. Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is an option, but of course they have to look at what is the revenue implication of doing that, and also the tax administration part of it. Uh, it's not easy to administrate that kind of system. The second big issue is the value-added tax. Uh, at this point, again, tax system is very segmented. There is a standard tax system where the big companies are in, and there is a simplified tax system where most of the companies are. Uh, only the companies in the standard tax system pay value-added tax at the, at the standard rate at this point. Uh, they want to open, they want to bring more companies into the value-added tax net, but they also want to reduce the value-added tax rate pretty drastically going from 20 to 12 percent. Uh, whether that's feasible from a revenue uh, point of view and from a tax administration point of view as well is questionable in the short term. Because right now, let's say you have 5,000 companies paying value added tax. After that, you may have 100,000 100, companies paying value added tax. So you need a tax administration that can handle that, that kind of change in volume. Third big issue is what to do about the personal income tax. Uh, there, the idea they are pushing uh, pushing around right now is to move to a flat uh, income tax and combine it with uh, social contributions. So basically, having social contribution and the personal income tax combined into a flat tax. Uh, that's a very unusual combination. Uh, I, I have. To to say because I think social security is, is very different. I mean, the reason why you have a social security contribution is very different from why you have a personal income tax. Uh, again, the issue there will be what would be the revenue implication and uh, how would you administrate the system like that. But there's clearly a charge influence on the tax reform right now. Um, ultimate success of reforms will be measured by, uh, obviously, economic performance. And where the most important ingredient, to me at least, is how private sector is growing and how it creates new jobs, at what pace. Unfortunately, we see many reforms in many different places in the world that reforms are made, some nice numbers are created, but they are not translated into real economic growth. And I think uh, there is an opportunity, obviously, in Uzbekistan, like it is everywhere in the world, but this is essential to aim at creation of environment where private sector can really grow and really be the driver of new job creation and prosperity and growth. And that should be, and I think what I see reading and uh, learning and uh, obviously educating myself what is happening right now in Uzbekistan is that I think there's an understanding that this is the driver for for future growth. And that's where I see uh, ground for my optimism, and this, which is, I assume is reflected in the paper. Copies of the paper were here, it's online, and it's available, and it will be appearing in this book, which will be uh, out fairly shortly, or 
early in the summer. We're honored to have Ambassador Mahabov here from Uzbekistan. Can I call on you for an observation? Thank you very much for hosting me. I'm very delighted to be here. Um, as I um, found, the audience uh, presenting here is very pessimistic on issues concerned with Pakistan, on where Pakistan is now. So um, <coughs> I would like to share with some. Uh, comments, ideas uh, on questions raised today. So, uh, <coughs> uh, changes occurring in Uzbekistan are tremendous and unprecedented, never before. Just recently, a legendary German rock band, the Scorpions, visited Uzbekistan. And I mentally remember some parts of the lyrics of their famous song, Futures in the Air. I can feel it everywhere, blowing with the wind of change. So these few words describe the current situation in Uzbekistan. The situation uh, we can observe ourselves in here in this city. So, uh, Expressing literally, the ice is melting. The flow has started. About questions. So, um, statistics. Uh, last year, uh, President, in his own address to our National Assembly, pointed out that we have only abandoned such unacceptable measures of work as chasing figures and statistics. Expressing by his words, no fake news anymore. So uh, today, Mamoga pointed out some figures uh, related to our GDP, related to our turn up, uh, uh, trade turnover, and many others. And all of them are true, believe me. So uh, speaking, uh, our statistics. So uh, last year we decided uh, to join uh, IMF's general data dissemination system and we expect the post on national data survey all data, all data, all national data related to economic, social, microeconomic um, and uh, many other uh, spheres. So, my uh, colleague from Kazakhstan uh, was very pessimistic on uh, investment climate in Uzbekistan. So, um, I would like to uh, point out uh, just some uh, parts uh, that were uh, printed in paper paid by Mamoka. So, here today, foreign investment had reached 4.2 billion, of which 3.7 billion consisted of foreign uh, direct investment. Let it be noted that between 2011 and 2016, foreign investment in Uzbekistan had decreased from 3.3 billion to 1.9 billion, a drop of 40%. So, um, as Dr. Starr, a superstar in Central Asian research, Recommended today, just familiarize that, those papers and you will uh, find more information, more direct information on this background. And I'm very hopeful that you will be very optimistic having read this book. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. I want to thank you all. Uh, but in closing, and in recognition of, of our wonderful Bumsfeld fellows here from all over the region, 
I, I want to close on, on, a, on a regional note. Uh, everything that we're talking about today, for good or ill, affects, it affects, affects the region of Central Asia, which includes Afghanistan. It, this is not a local development. It, it's bound to have both uh, positive and negative impacts efforts everywhere. And it is. And the, I'm sure if you did a survey as, as, as the great uh, American political scientist Carl Deutsch did uh, 60 years ago, uh, if you did a survey of phone calls or email messages or mail going back and forth within the region today, and compared it with five years ago, I'm sure you'd see a big jump upwards. And that's something that indicates that there's something really happening on that level. And I, in that connection, I want to raise two points. First, uh, in June, uh, every year, we, with the Rumsfeld Foundation, the Central Asia Caucus Institute, has a conference, which is called the Kanka Conference. It was invented by our former fellows and they take a leading role in it. And this, and it is a regional, if you think of a, 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 a regional world economic forum focused on Central Asia and without all the bombast. It, it's a, it, it, in a Central Asia, the Caucasus, Afghanistan, and Mongolia. This is going to be held in June in Baku, and all the countries will be represented but also major political figures, economic figures from the region will be there and from outside. I invite you all to come and, 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 and join us. Really an interesting gathering. If you want to see the future, that's the place to go. Now finally, uh, since this, uh, about, about the developments as a whole, those of you who are acquainted with American baseball know the great moment in sport that took place when Babe Ruth uh, stepped up to the, to, to the plate to hit and in a, in a moment of supreme self-confidence pointed to the rear wall of the stadium where he declared, I'm going to hit the ball over the fence. And he did. It's an amazing achievement. By the way, Rumsfeld fell us all up to the baseball season. Started, you want to get out to a game uh, or two. 